I'm going to kick off Georgine Rinneries from Deloitte. Um, really, uh, really excited to be welcoming you this morning um, to this fantastic event where we're going to talk about decarbonisation of the construction sector in Queensland. Um, and a huge thank you to Mechler, who's done a lot of the hard work uh, in, in, in setting this up as an online hybrid event. Uh, we've got a beautiful room of people here, smiley, happy faces, um, and uh, feeling enthusiastic for the, the dialogue here in Brisbane. And we have many, many people online. Uh, we here uh, on the lands of the Turrbal and Yagara people, and I pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. It really is such a blessing to have First Nations people uh, walking amongst us. And, you know, we are grateful for their wisdom. Um, we're also really looking forward to an opportunity to affirm a voice to Parliament uh, when we have an opportunity for a referendum. And so it's um, um, hopefully soon. Um, I'm going to hand over to Monica. Um, I am going to assume that everyone here sort of generally saw the lie of the land on level 23, um, but bathrooms are back in the corridor. If there are emergency tones, somebody who knows what they do, are doing will come to save us. But we will gather um, here and 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 be be taken downstairs. So thank you very much, um, Monica. I'm going to hand over to you. Thank you very much. Thanks, Georgine. And it's I'm really delighted to be here today on uh, Turrbal land, the um, engine. So my name is Monica Richter. I work in the climate, energy, and food security team in WWF, and I'm also project director for MECLA. I'm also a Queenslander, although I haven't been living here for 30 years, but I still feel like uh, this is my home. And uh, so welcome to our hybrid Meckler event. You know, sometimes the tech takes a bit of um, getting used to, but uh, I think we're, we're really, uh, it's a great opportunity for us to have people in person and also people um, online at the moment. Yeah, we've got about 26 people online and we had about 100 registrations so it's a great opportunity to uh, tell our story and i uh, really delighted that we were able to do this in participation with Deloitte and with um, Nicole from Planet Arc Ace Hub and Nicole will get a chance at the end to make some, some final comments. Um, so today we shine a spotlight on embodied carbon and the opportunity for Queensland to be aiming high for a climate positive Olympics 2032. And would you believe it is a, about 100 months away? Isn't that a scary thought? <laughs> <laughs> so, um, but so, so as we're recording this event, all our events are recorded and it will be available uh, on, uh, online on our MECLA website. Um, please, for those of you online, do use the chat function. There's a chance for us, you know, we'll get a chance at the end for some for the panel, a panelist conversation. So please put in your, your commentary. Um, this event does qualify as a CPD point under the Green Building Council's professional development process. So you can um, send an email to us. And as always, for all our MECLA events, uh, just a reminder of our governance requirements, we do not tolerate any anti-competitive behaviour. We operate in a pre-competitive environment. So if you are aware of any conflicts of interest, please speak up and we will adjust accordingly. So embodied carbon, 70% um, of Australia's infrastructure enables the majority of uh, Australia's greenhouse gas emissions. In the built environment sector, embodied carbon makes up about 16% of Australia's emissions. And if we don't do anything about it by 2050, according to the research by the Green Building Council, it will be 85% of our built environment emissions. So it's a pretty significant uh, challenge for us to try and uh, drive decarbonisation. So MECLA, you know, we were established with uh, the support of now 140 organisations right across the uh, the ecosystem of construction from your architects, engineers, you know, structural engineers, head contractors, all the way through to the supply chain. And here, today you'll hear from, from some of those, as well as governments, the importance of government as both an enabler of change and a procurer of the services that some construction industry provides. So we really are, have been set up for a short time. We're an alliance of organisations and people 
uh, who uh, we call ourselves a do tank. We're all about the doing of addressing those barriers to the uptake of body carbon, which we know in the exploratory work that we did in partnership with uh, Len Lease that we released our findings in August 2020, that uh, there are significant barriers, but a collaborative approach to trying to address those barriers will help us to achieve those, those requirements. And I just want to sort of share a, a couple of the insights from some of the working groups. So working group one, uh, how, how METLA set up with a range of different working groups, industry associations volunteer their time. A lot of it is in kind and some there is a small fee as well, but that in kind contribution over the last 18 months with one of the working groups around the demand side, one of the areas that they've been looking at is a pledge prerequisite. So just as an example, the pledge prerequisite requires head contracts. This is, this is a pledge to the head contractors to establish an embodied visions target as a minimum requirement for them to tender for government work. And that particular working group has been speaking to government agencies, various procurement um, agencies all around Australia in a range of different guises. It's just an idea that would be one way to help drive that level and shifting the bell curve forward. Uh, we know many tier one contractors and we'll hear from some of those um, contractors today that they're already, they've, they've been setting science-based targets, they've been addressing their scope one and two emissions, you know, they're really driving that. But how, how do we actually shift and create a level of ambition right across government and industry? And the other element of, I guess, the MECLA conversation is the importance of having both government and industry cooperate and collaborate. And you'll hear today from New South Wales government and you know, the language they're using around the race to the top and co-creating some standards and expectations. Because industry has been saying uh, in, in the conversations we've been having that they want to be at the table earlier. They want to be able to help drive those, those changes. So, you know, we're really seeing that intervention across all parts of the market today. And, you know, we've got the conference, the climate conference happening in Egypt at the moment. And we know that some um, climate issues are, are really significant and we need to be addressing that. And I'm really excited to see the announcements coming out of the Queensland government. Um, yesterday, you know, the Premier was in Townsville looking to build out a 10 gigawatts of renewable energy to help drive a green hydrogen transformation. So as Australia you know, creates this ambition about being a renewable energy superpower, it's a really significant uh, opportunity for Australia to um, contribute to the green metals, green hydrogen, decarbonising. Program. Again, another fact. So I, I heard when I was at a conference last week of Impact X. So we've built out over the last seven years in Australia 19 gigawatts of renewable electricity, and we'd have to do that again and again over the next seven years just to achieve 100% renewable electricity. So we're then thinking about an exponential increase through the building out of hydrogen. That's a significant amount of engagement with supply chains. That's a significant amount of materials that we're going to need. And if we can have, you know, a substantial portion of those to be decarbonised, I think that's really exciting for us to drive a whole new innovation opportunity for, for Australia. And I guess just as a reflection, that investment and engagement also needs to be uh, a conversation with industry, with government and civil society. We need to ensure there is benefit sharing right across society. And we also need to make sure that our biodiversity and it is, its nature positive in its own ways. We don't want to create one problem or unexpected consequences of that. So here we are at um, this point in time in being able to bring our speakers um, to the table and introducing you to them. Um, so today we'll hear from Kimberly Camaras, who's the Director of Climate Positive Brisbane 2032 on climate futures in the Department of Environment and Science. And Kimberly will you know, really demonstrate uh, the opportunity for Queensland to be a leader uh, with some clear guidelines for what the Queensland Government is going to be putting in place. Um, Pamela Henderson, oh, sorry, ne next will be Valentina Petroni, who is WSP's Circular Economy Lead 
And she's really going to encourage us to use our imagination around the circular economy. It is going to require imagination and a different way of thinking, design thinking, and I'm really excited to hear what Valentina has to say. Uh, Pamela Henderson will follow. She is the Executive Director of Technical Services Transport for New South Wales. And you know, that principle about engaging early, engaging with industry. I think that will be a really exciting case study for um, Queensland government officials to hear what another jurisdiction has been doing in that area. And then we move to some of our other industry um, providers. So Holly Hines, General Manager Roads from Lang O'Rourke, but also, you know, very steeped in sustainability and we'll, we'll have a very exciting story for, for um, Holly to share, as well as Jeremy Mansfield, National Sustainability Manager at Rend Lease, uh, to also talk about the ambition around absolute zero target by 2040. And, you know, that's, that's a re really significant, so uh, ambitious goal to have to achieve. And lastly, Michael Kemp. Um, CEO of Earth Friendly Concrete at Wagner's, a Queensland-owned business. So, speakers, 10 minutes. I am going to be pretty strict around that, please. I know that there's so much to cover, but um, I'd like to welcome Kimberly as our first speaker. Thank you. There we go. So just the button. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Thank you, Monica and Georgine. I'd also like to acknowledge that we meet on the lands of the um, Turbul and Yagara people um, and pay my respects as well. So thank you for having me to speak on behalf of Queensland Government this morning. Um, it's a really exciting time for Queensland, as we all know, with the uh, dot on the horizon that is the Brisbane 2032 Olympics and Paralympic Games. And it really gives us the opportunity to drive some levels of innovation that are perhaps sort of unprecedented in Queensland. So I'm here really to give a bit of an overview of uh, what the commitments are from uh, the perspective of the partners, so the Queensland government, uh, the various local governments and the federal government around climate positivity and sustainability for Brisbane 2032. And then we'll have a little bit of a think about what some of the mechanisms to drive circular economy outcomes and sustainable procurement through these commitments might be. So we'll dive straight in, given Monica is very strict on time. So um, as you all know, the Games have committed to be climate positive, and, and that's really exciting. The first two commitments that you'll see on the slide here are, around, are, are more around the event itself, although, of course, uh, include other aspects of Games planning as well. Um, and they are to minimise emissions as much as possible that are associated with Brisbane 2032, um, and of course in line with Paris, and to offset more than the residual of the remaining emissions. Sure. Um, potentially the most uh, uh, powerful aspect though of um, the climate positivity commitments is that third commitment, which is really about using the games as a mechanism or a catalyst to drive further transformation and change. And when it comes to uh, the aspect of procurement. Yeah. How are we going there, Mike? Is that? Yeah. I think we're on. Can everyone on? Can someone online just give me a thumbs up, Pamela? Can you see those slides? Wonderful. Thank you. We'll keep going. Um, perhaps most exciting when we think about the climate positivity commitments for the games is that third pillar that you can see on the screen there. That really there's a commitment by the Queensland government, but also by all layers of government to use this event as a catalyst to influence and create change and drive and deliver lasting climate benefits for Queensland and for Australia. So when we think about procurement, and uh, we were having this conversation yesterday, a couple of people in this room actually, that, that the procurement for the game associated with the games is about a five, uh, you know, billion dollar uh, piece of procurement. When we look at what the Queensland government will procure in the lead up to 2032, we're looking at $220 billion. So the scope is immense. If we can use this event as a, a way to drive a broader and lasting change, uh, the opportunities are really exciting. So many people will probably be already familiar with these priorities. These are the Olymp uh, International Olympic Committee's sustainability priority areas. So as you probably probably be aware, throughout the bidding process for the Games, commitments were made under all of these priority areas. So obviously climate, um, not only including climate emissions uh, targets, but also 
climate risk and resilience objectives. I mean, another technical fix well, up here. Having your agility in the way. Can you <laughs> adapt, you know? <laughs> I'll keep talking while, while Monica's fiddling with that, if that's okay. Um, I think um, I'll just really briefly touch on the other sustainability priority areas of the IOC. I think that's important. Climate positivity gets the headlines, of course, but it's, um, as Monica touched on earlier, we can't view those commitments in a vacuum from all other areas of sustainability. Um, uh, infrastructure and natural sites. There's a whole range of um, infrastructure commitments that I'll touch on briefly a, a little bit later that we'll make through the bidding process um, and that will really ensure that we're not limited to driving climate outcomes, but rather is, you know, zero waste and circular outcomes in addition to, to a range of other sustainability priorities. The ISC um, also has a, a priority area around mobility, which is, of course, around transport and low emissions transport, sustainable transport, but also accessibility. And, you know, we, we can't forget the lens of the Paralympics um, as a real driver and a reminder for us about how far we have to go in terms of making our transport more accessible. Um, of course, uh, workforce um, is really important. Um, how do we procure things and how do we ensure that um, that, that, that supply chain is ethical, um, that obviously modern slavery impacts and the like are, are, minimized, are, are avoided completely um, and that we have really strong ethical and local um, uh, workforce opportunities. And of course, this sourcing and resource management. There are a range of commitments made um, in that in that priority area that are that are really fundamental for us to achieve um, circular economy outcomes for Queensland. I really will just briefly like to say these are of course the IOC's sustainability priorities. They align with the SDGs really well, which is fantastic. Um, anything that we think about that's really truly sustainable, circular, regenerative for a place has to be contextual. Um, and so, you know. These are a great guide, but there are things that are Queensland specific that we really need to bring to these discussions, notwithstanding the, the, the wisdom in terms of sustainability that our um, traditional owners of these lands hold. So I think that we just need to keep that in mind as well. Just really briefly, the timeline for developing the, the Olympics and Paralympic Games is, is a long one. As we know, we have a 10 year pipeline rather than the um, traditional seven years, which is very exciting but also uh, brings with it, you know, a little bit more complexity when we think about how we stage these planning processes. So, of course, at the moment, we're, we are really in this planning phase. And I think it's important to remember that um, this is a really collaborative effort. There are a series of games partners, um, the various local governments, uh, Queensland government and the federal government as well. And we also have... Um, uh, no. We're fine. Um, I'll try and keep going. Um, so obviously we, we have a series of game partners during that planning process, but we can, can't forget that the OCOL, the uh, Organisation Committee for the Olympic Games, has really leading responsibility for the event-centred um, aspects of games planning and delivery. So, of course, we'll work really closely with the, that committee as it continues to grow. Um, but where the Queensland Government and the partners are focused is legacy. How do we act now to lay the foundations for long-term legacy outcomes for Queensland and for Australia? And in the context of today's discussion, what does that mean for the regulatory but also the capacity building initiatives we need to start driving uh, to, to ensure that the market's actually ready for the OCOL to procure circular, low, zero waste, um, low emissions goods and services? So that's a little bit of, of, of where the thinking and where the, the roles and responsibilities um, lie. So. Collective effort, but one that um, uh, does need that, that delineation of roles and responsibilities as well. Okay. Um, I hope that people on, online can hear, can see the slides, at least even if it isn't in presentation mode. Um, otherwise, I'll try to do my best to verbally summarise. Okay. So in terms of that um, planning pipeline, where we're at now is, as I mentioned, of course, in that, in that early stage of planning, um, and I think this slide's a really good one for just capturing some of the opportunities around both acceleration, but also transformation. Acceleration of what we're already planning to do is really important. But as Monica touched on um, just earlier, there's also there also needs to be an element of transformation that occurs here that is really catalyzed by the games and that changes our thinking about what's possible for Queensland across all areas of climate positivity and sustainability. Um, and of course, really understanding the interrelationship between all of those elements is important. I think it's really, uh, and, and Monica touched on um, what uh, Valentina will discuss in this area as well, 
it actually, what we do is really important, but how we think about um, the possibilities is perhaps even more important, um, opening our minds to different ways of working. And certainly we're already seeing that across layers of government um, uh, to, to, to ensure that that in, a, in and of itself is a legacy that's driven by the games. All right, let's keep moving along. So I did mention earlier that some really significant commitments have been made through the, the bid process around infrastructure delivery. And um, when we think of that 10-year pipeline, first cab off the rank really has to be infrastructure, given the, the length of time that those pieces of work will take. So as you might be aware in the, in the bid process and um, all of the commitments um, at, at that level underneath those ISD priorities are available publicly through the Future Host Questionnaire document. Uh, the commitments that the partners made were to deliver infrastructure that um, meets six star green star um, or the associated ISC ratings tool standards. Um, and that's really important because it's setting the bar early for all parties who are involved in infrastructure and signaling, signaling to the market excuse me, around the, the level of ambition that will be associated with those pieces of infrastructure. And I think it's interesting when we when we look at the possibilities that, that a six-star green star roadmap provides, um, people obviously jump to the emissions, the emissions uh, outcomes that will be achieved through that. But, you know, that's really driving zero waste initiatives and really pushing us to think early about how we um, deliver circular outcomes through those processes. So, uh, infrastructure, really big current focus, particularly for the Queensland Government, and a really good opportunity for us to work collectively with those ratings bodies to look at infrastructure and ratings a little bit differently as well. So how can we lift our view from a, you know, 14 individual projects, for example, to look at the portfolio of work that's happening and to map opportunities in terms of um, credit achievement across all of those, all of those pieces of infrastructure as a collective. I think it's a real opportunity for a Queensland government in particular to work uh, in a more collaborative manner with GBCA and with, with, with ISC as well around what that looks like um, and, and what the interrelationships between uh, those ratings tools um, and, and the outcomes that they drive will be. So how are we going for time, Monica? A couple of minutes? Okay. So in terms of levers for action um, and... It's a really tricky topic to cover in 10 minutes. I think I, I will refer you to the Future Host Questionnaire. It's a really good place to start to drive in, uh, more, dive in more deeply, I'm sorry, to all the, the commitments that have been made. But in terms of just leading into the discussion today, many leaders for action obviously exist currently and will evolve further over the runway to 2032. So clearly from a Queensland government perspective, our procurement um, regulations and, and, and policies can really drive change. Uh, notwithstanding, they need to be accompanied by foundational capacity building, uh, particularly for our small to medium enterprise uh, business sector. So, you know, Queensland's uh, procurement policy um, is, is a really strong mechanism for us to signal to the market what being ready to supply for 2032 looks like, um, and that will continue to evolve and iterate over the next 10 years. I think it's also worth mentioning that the OCOG, the Olympic Games Organisation Committee, will develop uh, the Sustainable Sourcing and Resource um, Management Plan for the event itself. And that occurs in line with the broader games planning processes. There is input from the layers of government that are partners, um, but that's an OCOG-led initiative. And really uh, that focuses on, an, on a number of different things, but I think importantly for this discussion, we'll really look at how we optimise the circularity in terms of the event. How do we prioritise hiring over purchase, of course, but what does that mean subsequent to the event? And setting some guidelines around sustainable purchasing, importantly, uh, minimising embodied and operational emissions. Really briefly, for the event itself, um, in terms of the emissions pie, uh, obviously one of the biggest proportions is, is spectator travel, where Southern Hemisphere games, and that's um, a really significant impact. But also the temporary and overlay infrastructure, um, is, is, um, is, is another uh, significant, probably the second most significant piece of emissions generating activity associated with the event itself. So that really needs to be a key focus area early in terms of um, circularity, looking at embodied emissions, but looking at use um, uh, after the event itself and the life cycle of those, of those goods. Given that we are um, running out of time, and I hope that you uh, were able to bear with our little uh, uh, technical issues there, but 
I just wanted to, to end um, and, and lead into the, the other discussions and, and, and uh, speakers with, with, this, with this point. The games is 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 a, a real uh, dot on the horizon, um, as we heard and the last time we were, a lot of us were in this room when, when Professor Jacqueline Kramer was was speaking. It's an opportunity for us to approach things differently, and I think it's really important to, to say that government can't and shouldn't deliver on all of the legacy outcomes that could be driven through the games. Um, this is an opportunity for us to work collectively in partnership, in genuine partnership with government, with industry, with advisory groups to look at achieving outcomes that are, in fact, quite transformational. Um, and we will really be looking at taking this approach at the Department of Environment and Science and how we continue to work um, in areas like circular economy, but also sustainable tourism and destinations and all of the other associated things that we're really trying to drive as legacy outcomes through Brisbane 2032. Uh, Partnerships focused on a common vision, which we're really lucky to have quite clearly set through the bidding process, are really critical. And I think that um, if we can if we can establish some of these partnerships effectively and early, we're setting us, ourselves up for success for 2032, but also for 2042 and beyond. Thank you.